I didn't even see the Dragon Ball movie. No, there's certain... You know, this is the problem, is that I, uh... There's certain movies that I know I should see, but I'm so, uh... I cannot bring myself to financially support something that I that I don't believe in. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I still have not seen episode three of Star of Star Wars. Just because episode one and two so offended well, episode one so offended me, I couldn't I just couldn't go on, right? But then I had to audition to do a voice match for Django Fett. Uh, and so I had to hear him in episode two. Luckily a buddy of mine lent me a DVD which was out by then, and so I watched the DVD on my laptop, sitting in bed, swearing at the screen the entire time. Uh, my wife is like, what the hell is going on? I'm like, where's Jeff from? You know, so I haven't even, I can't, I can't. If someone wants to lend me episode three, I guess I will punish myself and watch it. Because people say it's better than the first two. And I was like, yeah, how do you get up from zero, you know? Um, there's nowhere else to go down, you know? No, you can keep going down. Um, so, I, yeah, that's, that's my, so one of those Dragon Ball things, I just go, no, I can't, I can't. I can't, good conscience, give people money for making that. So, I'll have to see it at some point. Anything else? Yes. What's the hardest character? The hardest character for me to play, honestly, one of the hardest things I've had to do. Ladies and gentlemen, I can outdo you. Um, who? We are featuring Who? Two K Brown, star of Babylon Five and Star Trek. Okay. Bruce Dern, star of Sean Bunny, Richard Gibbs, Big Love. Really? Classic Halloween film and Cowboys. Yeah. Harvard Kidder, mostly the original Superman franchise. I know Marco. Hi, Marco. And inside the Super Chewbacca for the higher tenure of Star Wars. Oh. Sienna Nelson, my favorite in the Star Wars special. And Demona from Gargoyles. Met Freddy Krueger. I'm going. See ya. Peace. <laughs> um, I actually met Freddy Krueger, Robert Englund, while we were recording Spider-Man. He played the vulture, and he's really into theater. And so we had this nice long talk about sort of Peter Brook and British theater, and oh, it's fantastic. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, we were talking about the hardest character, right? Um, it was actually on Wolverine and the X-Men. I play multiple man on Wolverine on one episode of Wolverine and the X-Men, and they called me in. And I say, I say like two lines, and then a hundred of me get my ass kicked by the X-Men. <laughs> and I'm sort of infamous for being able to do good fight sounds and attack sounds, and that's why they cast me. They said, oh, he'll be perfect for that. That was the hardest thing I have ever done, because it's not like a video game or anything else where you have to have attack sounds. Because usually in a video game, it's like you do small, medium, and large. But when you're doing, uh, when you're doing it in the middle of a scene, you have your sort of noises, uh, 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 and then you don't realize that you've only got about five of them. And so you go, uh, 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 and then you end up repeating yourself and you don't realize it until they play it back and you realize, oh crap, that sounds just like the one, you know, effort 10 sounds just like effort two, and effort 12 sounds just like effort four. So we've got to pick up effort 10, 12, 32, 55, 163, 5,334. I mean, it was just every one of them had to sound different from the other one. And I was sweating bullets. I have never worked so hard in a session in my life because not only was I trying to do this thing, which takes a lot of energy, trying to do all these attack sounds and getting the crap kicked out of me, but I had to remember the noise, not the word, the noise that I made 20 noises ago <laughs> so that I didn't repeat it. Oh my God, it was, it was mind numbing. And then it like went to the commercial break, and the director's like, okay, I think that's it. And then we come back, and then Iceman and Storm, and everyone else shows up. I'm like, oh, God. It was endless. So, yeah, that was probably one of the hardest. Ugh, that was rough. That was fun. And Lair, the video game Lair. That was rough because usually the roughest video games are the uh, war games, like World War II games. Fire the whole air! And after, 
you're doing like two or three hours of that, you're just trashed. But usually, even in the war games, there's like, hey, dude, you want to go do something? Huh? Um, but in Lair, we're all uh, fighting on Dragonback, and so we're literally screaming at the top of our lungs over the wind, trying to talk to each other on the other dragon. I had all oh, thrashed after that. It was, I was like, I had to rest for like two days before I could get my voice back properly. Anything else? Yes. Buffy and which one? Moonlight. Oh, okay. I don't know Moonlight. I, I like Buffy. Uh, I like. I think. I think. Uh, well, because Joss Whedon is pretty fantastic as a writer. Uh, and I, what, I, I never would have thought until uh, actually uh, a friend of my wife's uh, said, oh, you have to watch Buffy. And she started watching Buffy. And then she sat me down and said, Christmas, you have to watch Buffy. And I was like, uh, okay. And so, you know, the first you know, the first half of the first season, you're like, okay, monster of the day, I'm not quite sure. And then you're like, oh, no, wait a minute, this is good. You know, and especially when Spike shows up, you're like, okay, now this is really good. You know, um, so uh, yeah, I'm 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 a big fan of of, of Buffy and the Buffy Verse. Uh, I'm a big fan of Firefly. Uh, yeah, fantastic. And uh, did you realize that Joss was one of the writers on the Disney Atlantis movie? And you remember the Latina chick in the Atlantis movie? Yeah, who's the mechanic? Who's Kaylee in Firefly? He just transferred her over to Firefly as the mechanic chick there. And I was like, oh, interesting. Um, but uh, I, it, I think vampires are cool. I think, uh, I, I was very into, I had this fantastic CD-ROM, this company called the Voyager Company, that used to make these wonderful sort of educational CD-ROMs. I don't know if they even exist anymore. Um, I have to boot my Macintosh into OS 9 to use these things. But uh, one of them was called Nosferatu, and it was the, uh, the Murnau silent film, but with this guy who was a Dracula scholar, and he would sort of give you running commentary during the film if you wanted to tell you about the stuff. And then the CD-ROM itself had this whole, whole interactive history of Lopi and Paler and everything that had been going on at that time, and so I was really fascinated by it. And uh, I've always been interested to see how the vampire trope sort of changes over time, and I think one of the interesting things about Helsing is it's the first sort of pimp vampire with guns, you know, that, that we've ever had. It's sort of like Tarantino's version of a vampire, you know? And, uh, and, and, and I think that's interesting. And I think that the whole vampire thing is all about sex um, and all about... Originally, it was about the dangers of Eastern Europe and the idea of the, the poison of Eastern Europe coming and infecting the good, upright, standing British people who buggered their valets, you know, not, not so upright. But, um, but uh, so I think, it's, I think vampires will never die because people like this idea of playing with um, what is the animalistic side of sexuality or what is taboo. Um, don't know if you know, but in the original Nosferatu, um, the reason he dies is because uh, the girl gives herself willingly to him so that uh, he, instead of feeding off of Jonathan Harker, which is a homosexual relationship, which is supposed to be bad, he has a sort of hetero relationship with her, and because she willingly gives herself, he dies when the sun rises. And unfortunately, what people think is that the sun hits him and kills him. And that's not, it's just, a, it's sort of, it, 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 people just get that from watching the film, and so that got added into vampire lore, but that's actually not part of vampire lore. Vampires should be able to walk in the sun, no problem. It's just that because of the silent film, the sun hits him and he disappears, we think the sun kills vampires. Um, uh, same thing with Sherlock Holmes and his pipe. Uh, it turns out that, that Sherlock Holmes never smoked that big droop bowl meerschaum pipe that you always see him with. He never smoked that. Arthur Conan Doyle never wrote him with that pipe. He always had a very thin cherrywood pipe. But when they first staged Sherlock Holmes, the only pipe that the actor could keep balanced in his mouth and still say his lines was that Drew Bull pipe. So all the illustrators adopted that as the Sherlock Holmes pipe when it never was. Um,